two of you. Two of you, and I think a couple of people online as well. So a special welcome to you. Um, and uh, how many have been to a First Communion preparation here at St. Clair in the last year or two? Okay. I love it, you children have lot. you parents who have lots of children. So every so often you get to come back to these. I know how much you look forward to them. Um, so we're grateful for you who are doing kind of a, a repeat. And so some things I'm doing, I'm, I've sort of I've done in some years, I kind of mix and match based on feedback I get. Um, but the way we do at St. Clair the Sacraments is um, turning it into a, kind of a, a Catholic 101 night for you guys, you all as parents, um, so that you can uh, continue to learn more about your own Catholic faith, and then you can teach it to your children. So you hear me say this in my homilies so many times, you are the first and primary teachers of your children. So if they're going to be Catholic or how they're going to be Catholic, 99% of that is going to come from you and what they see in your homes. What they get at Mass and what they get in school or PSR, we do, or it could be from 1% to about 5% influence that we have. Um, so I know especially, uh, depending on what where your children most of yours are in second grade, we have some in other grades, uh, but sometimes you can doubt yourself, like, I don't know if I have any influence over this child anymore. <laughs> you know, they seem so independent. Um, even teenagers still, um, surveys show that the number one influence, even on a teenager um, or a rebellious second grader, the number one influence when they survey them is it's mom and dad. Um, so just when you start to doubt you're having influence or, um, but we know that they are doing because they parrot us, don't they? Um, they pick up all of our words and our phrases and our attitudes as well. So we know that they're listening and paying attention. So I want to encourage you um, in that. So one of the, we at St. Clair, we turn these nights into, um, again, Catholic 101 for you, kind of an update on what is the Eucharist, so that when I'm talking to my child about their first communion, I can talk a little more freely about the Eucharist, because we don't expect you to you know, have a degree in theology, but to have a core sense of that. So A, it's, it's kind of an adult ed night. Um, and secondly, as Jane lists in our folder, um, what I always say that basically we offer you three tracks. And sorry, there's a little bit of an echo. Can you hear me though? But we need it for the sound system. Um, that we offer three tracks, meaning I always say track A, I want to go to Economy Plus and teach them a little bit more and so I'm going to do, so let's say we offer you 15 things, because I'm going to offer you about five tonight homework, and then the packet's got more and the handout's more. So we're offering you, I'm throwing out a number, about 15 things that you as a parent can choose, because track C is people say, no, I'm all in. I totally want to spend time teaching my child about the Eucharist, and I want to grow in it myself. So we're all in, we're going track C, and we're going to do the most. Um, to have, so it's a faith formation experience for me as the parent, um, for my child, and some of the exercises we do are for other siblings as well. So you see what we're doing here? So you have to choose because you're the teacher of the faith and how they learn their Catholic faith is going to be from you. So, but we offer, because I can't require everybody to do track C, which is going to be required several hours a week. You know, now you're saying, I don't have time for this. I'm already, you know, homeschooling my child and the school is closed one more time and so forth. But that's where the decision comes in, which we always say, you don't have to do First Communion this year. This isn't a good time in our lives. You know, this is going on, that's going on. We get, our lives are chaotic. We don't have time for all this. So we say, you know, we're going to do First Communion next fall or next year um, because we think things are going to be a little bit better. So, but it is a, it is a big commitment, um, but it's worth it because of the beautiful gift of teaching our children about the Eucharist. They are learning about it in school and our PSR, um, but what we're offering for you are ways to, to learn more about it yourself and then to talk about it your children and do some of the activities that we're going to do, okay? Track A, B, and C. We're laying it all out there, and as you're doing this, so tonight I'm going to be giving you um, some homework. So when we, when we walked in, we had uh, two handouts for you, and uh, so I hope for those who are online, you need to have those handouts that Jane uh, emailed to you. Um, one is called The Rhythm and Structure of the Eucharist, um, and the other was um, a little uh, sheet with the questions on it, because we're going to be using these hands-on. So if you haven't printed it out, go print it out now or pull it out up, up on your tablet. Um, and because we're going to be having you kind of do a little writing exercise, if you could have, we hand it out also, I have some extras up here uh, on your sheet, so you have something, hard, you know, hard background to write on. Does anybody need an extra? Or you have something, 
something, okay. Um, you guys are going to be doing some writing um, on, on the sheet. So just good to have something just kind of a little substantial to write on. So in that sense, um, for my opening prayer, um, if you will, after that introduction, um, my opening prayer is actually going to be a reading from the gospel that I want to use um, in my um, lesson tonight. And it comes from Mark's gospel. If you heard me on Sunday, um, we're, we're in the year of Mark. So as Catholics, our scriptures, um, you know, as Catholics, we can't do anything simple, right? So we take the Bible and we split it into three years, year A, B, and C. This year we are year in year B, and we read from the Gospel of Mark. Um, so last year we read Matthew, we're in Mark, next year is going to be Luke. John doesn't get a year. John's Gospel is kind of interspersed throughout the year. A lot of it's mostly in the Easter season um, and Christmas season. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke were in Mark. But then on weekdays, the scriptures are divided into two years. Um, so that's it kind of gets, so you got a three-year cycle going on and a two-year cycle. And then we get through uh, the majority of the Bible through these um, processes. So we're in year Mark, so I chose a gospel story from uh, Mark, and it's one of Jesus' miracles. Um, so let us uh, just take a moment now to listen to this gospel story. This is the third chapter um, of Mark, the first uh, few verses. Jesus returned to the synagogue um, where there was a man whose hand was withered and shriveled up. They kept an eye on Jesus to see whether he would heal the sick man on the Sabbath day, hoping to be able to bring an accusation against Jesus. Jesus addressed the man with a shriveled hand, stand up here in front. Then he said to, then he said to them, the Pharisees who were watching him, is it permitted to do a good deed on the Sabbath or an evil one to preserve life or to destroy it? At this they remained silent. He looked around at them with anger, for he was deeply grieved that they had closed their minds against him. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man did so, and his hand was perfectly restored. When the Pharisees went outside, they immediately began to plot with the Herodians how they might destroy Jesus. Now, it may seem like a, a strange gospel um, to start with uh, a talk on the Eucharist, uh, First Communion, um, but I want to use that gospel story um, as um, kind of an image of this man with a shriveled hand, a withered up hand. We've already had Jesus do a couple miracles in the gospel on Sundays, last couple Sundays. Now he's healing this man with a shriveled up hand. Um, we can imagine like this physical disability. So when we have stories like this, it's addressing Jesus once is particularly caring of people with physical disabilities and mental disabilities as well. So a lot of the stories have to deal with people who have these disabilities. So this one's got a disability with his hand, and he heals it. And I want to use this image of this man's healed hand, the withered hand and his healed hand, as symbols of what we do in the liturgy. Okay, So that's why I picked this gospel here. So it's a very spiritual image for us um, to follow. So in that sense... Um, I want to um, keep that gospel um, in mind now as we walk through um, kind of a flow of the liturgy that I want to cover tonight um, in what those two hands, the withered hand and uh, the healed hand, meaning um, the withered hand represents when we come to Jesus um, with our worries, our sin, addiction, sinful habits, all these things that kind of shrivel up our hands, our heart, and our mind. Okay, so that's kind of how we approach Jesus. We all have some version of a shriveled hand or a shriveled heart, a shriveled mind. It's pulled back because sin always shrivels us up. Our attitudes get bad and all these, so it represents a lot there. When the man's hand is healed, um, it does, later on it tells us that he becomes this disciple and then he uses his hands to glorify God. So we go from this conversion of, of, of sin or selfishness and worries and anxiety to being freed, set free, to now use my full body, my mind, and my soul to give praise to God. That's the ultimate goal, is to glorify God. We hear that in the gospel. To glorify God is the end goal. 
So the end goal isn't that I just become a nice person, that my kids become Catholic, that you know all these other end goals that we have, that my kids are successful, all that goes away. And the only thing that matters, did I spend my life glorifying God and helping my spouse, myself, and my children get to heaven? Because that's a billion years. This is 75. So all, we always have to remember, oh, that's right, I forgot the end goal here. Because um, we get, because life is complicated, it's difficult, it takes a lot of work to kind of manage these years that we have here on earth, so we just spend a lot of time here, but sometimes we lose track of that. But the fact that you're here tonight, you're saying, no, I know that that's my end goal, so I want to learn more about my Catholic faith. So I want to use those two images. Now I'd like to take out the, the sheet that we have, Because I'm trying to condense this, so there's so much I want to share with you. You know my love of the Eucharist as a priest, um, the joy of Mass, what the Eucharist all means to me. There's so many different ways I could take this tonight, but I thought it'd be good just to walk through an outline of the actual Mass, the liturgy, and see what we can learn from that to help myself participate better, to help my children participate better, so that then we can be here to glorify God and not just fulfill a Sunday obligation, okay? So I thought if we learn more about what's going on in the Mass, um, that would help us get our kids ready for their first communion, what this really means. So I want you to think about, what do your children already know about first communion? It's special, it's the body and blood of Jesus. If they got that all down, I'd like, hopefully tonight you're going to say, ah, I want to focus on these two things of helping my child, or these three, or these five and these other homework assignments are going to give you. Okay, so everybody get their um, hand, uh, the guideline out called Rhythm and Structure of the Eucharist. And I'm going to walk through this. So, um, does anybody here um, follow music? Um, you know a little bit about music in terms of, um, we call crescendo and decrescendo. So crescendo, the music gets kind of louder, and decrescendo, it kind of softens. Um, you know, different terminology for that as well. Um, or you can apply that to, you know, heartbeats or... You think of your own image here. But the line that goes down the side of the page, um, like a heart monitor uh, tracking, um, is what I want to follow because that line parallels, pardon the anti-pun, what's going on in this written column here. Okay? So, meaning as we move to each of these peaks, that's what's happening in the liturgy. Like in a sense, what are we building up to? what's kind of a low period, and what's kind of another peak that we're moving toward. You following me there? Um, So, because I think that can be helpful, meaning where should I sort of get my children to focus their energy or pay attention to if I was going to focus on a couple things, what would those be? And I think this can kind of help us. So I want to kind of walk through this, that kind of visual image, but it's sticking with this image of the the shriveled hands and the healed hands as well. Meaning, because at liturgy, when we come to Mass, We are here to give and get. Think of your hands doing that. Our hands give away, they help, they do this, but our hands are also take, or we get stuff, don't we, with our hands. So you think about how we use our hands, that's why we have this shriveled hand and healed hand image for us. So I want to walk through the different parts of the Mass, about how each of the parts of the Mass, what am I... Uh, giving at this part of the Mass, and what am I getting out of it? Okay, and it kind of flows with that flow chart of peaks um, and low times in the Mass as well. So let's, I, I, we aren't going to have time to do all of these, but I'm going to kind of do an overview of them. Let's start with the gathering hymn. Um, and you can even start before this. Prelude meanings, what's happening at home and in the car on the way to church. Okay. I remember with eight kids in the car getting, getting to Mass, we had committed so many sins by the time you got to church with eight kids and mom and dad and, you know, ah. so then after a certain age, they kind of, we went to two different masses. <laughs> you know, we just can't handle eight kids. So mom would take some kids and dad would take some kids, you know. So what's even happening to prepare for the Sunday Eucharist? Now I'm going to get into that to a minute here. But the gathering hymn, the opening song we might kill, opening hymn or processional hymn, it's got all these different titles there. But for a while, one way of talking about it is the gathering hymn. It's everybody coming together. And so the gathering him, what am I um, getting out of it? What am I getting out of the gathering him is I'm getting community. 
that when I get here and everybody else is singing this song with me, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just walked into a group of, during COVID, 225 people, non-COVID, uh, five, 600 people. I just walked into a group of people singing to God, giving praise to God. I am getting a sense of community. You follow me there? Um, what am I giving? I got to give up my agenda and my list of to-do things um, out the door. So I got to, um, I'm giving, um, giving up that, leaving it behind there, but I'm also coming to give praise to God. So under each of these, if you could track, what am I giving? I'm giving praise to God and giving up um, my own agenda. So I'm giving praise to God. And what am I getting out of it? A sense of community. So while the opening hymn be like, ah, I don't really know that, I don't know that song, so I'm going to put my thing down. That doesn't count because it's a prayer. It's the same thing like when your child doesn't know all the words of the Our Father, you could just say, no, stop praying it then. No, I got to learn the words of this song. So even if I don't know the melody, because it might be a new melody to me, although the music that we have here is more traditional, so if you notice these hymns have been sung you know, since 1720, 1800s, or whatever else, and we do some contemporary. But songs that have been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, we're trying to connect our children to what we are as Catholics, is have a historical connection um, as well. So what am I get giving? I'm giving praise to God. If you notice the text, so if you don't know the hymn, teach your child to follow these words. Oh my gosh, it says, Oh God, we're here to praise you. Oh God, we're here to, to thank you. Follow along those words. Oh, what am I doing? I'm giving thanks to God. That's a song we have this, um, we get, we're here to give thanks to God. Um, wow, so the, the opening hymn is oftentimes it's going to do two things that remind us while we're here, to give praise to God. And secondly, uh, our music director picks hymns that are connected to what you're going to hear in the scripture. So it's also a prelude. If I miss the prologue, I'm going to not really know what's going on in the first chapter, which is the first reading. You got me there? So that opening hymn, at least follow along in the text because I'm, I can mouth the words and teach my children to mouth the words and I'm learning the melody. But oh my gosh, it's praising God. I can choose not to praise God because I don't know that song. And so I'm going to stand here and look at the wall or the ceiling and then you've got to figure out what your purpose is then. Or I can at least try to praise God by following along with the text. Very powerful. Why am I here? To give praise to God. That means I've got to let go of my need of what's going to make me feel good. I'm here to praise God. And that opening song in some way gives praise and worship to God. Got me there so far? Okay, so um, let's um, move on. I mean, you could tell the greeting. The priest is the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's greeting you in the name of, of the Christian community. Now let's move to the penitential rite. What am I giving and what am I getting? Giving, what am I giving? Penitential rite means that Lord have mercy or the confiteor I confess to Almighty God. That's the penitential meaning, because penitent means sinner. So as sinners, we pray the penitential rite. I confess to Almighty God or the Lord have mercy. So in the penitential rite, what am I bringing with my hands and my heart? I'm giving to God honesty. So do you notice how we say, let us take a moment to prepare ourselves for this sacrifice? Call to mind our sins. I got to, what am I, what am I uh, giving? I'm giving honesty. God, here's where I need your help. Here's where I'm sinful. Here's where I'm selfish. Here's where I haven't trusted in you. So I, we intentionally take that moment of quiet, not to give you a break to get your breath. I mean, well, you might need to do that too if you're dragging kids to church. But it's a time to say, okay, God, I, gotta, I need to give up these sins, these habits, these attitudes. Um, uh, I've got I to gotta give God my honesty about what's going on in my life, which is why that penitential right, I should take about five minutes for that, shouldn't I? <laughs> Let's take five minutes to review our lives. We don't have time for that. So I give you about 20 to 30 seconds to think about what do I need to give God that needs healed? What am I getting? When the priest says, may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life, it's a mini absolution. So it's a mini confession, is that penitential writing. Again, if you need to take any notes, 
This is a mini confession. Name my sins and then let God wash me with, may Almighty God have mercy and forgive us our sin. That's how venial small sins can get, get forgiven so that we can, A, listen to his word and then come to communion here. First, we have to have our sins forgiven by God by that. Any mortal sins we need to take to um, confession. Um, we need to go to confession regularly anyway. But venial sins, um, you know, whatever those are, um, can be forgiven in that penitential right. What am I giving? Honesty, naming my sins, giving them to God. What am I getting? His mercy, his forgiveness. To lighten my heart. Oh my gosh, I've just been burdened with my, um, and, you know, my uh, impatience, whatever you've been burdened with. So after the penitential right, your shoulders should be a little bit lighter because God is now giving us his mercy, his hands, his hands of mercy. We bring our hands and then they're healed. Again, I'm like, I, could, I could take um, a lot of time. Let's but just go one more. The glory to God in the highest. Um, this is all about giving God praise. So after he has forgiven us, now we give God praise. So in a sense, you know, we could almost raise our hands saying, glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. But we do that with our voices. Again, if you're not going to sing it, say, I'm not a singer. Mouth the words because it's a song of praise. And we need to teach our children that. That's why it's, it's, in the, it's in the worship aid that we have there. Um, by me not singing it, and I stand to choose this, it's not that you're, well, you can define that however you want. <laughs> but the rest of the community is giving praise to God. So if I'm not participating in that, I don't know what you would be doing here because we're here to give praise to God. So you gotta think about, I gotta rethink about why I'm coming here if I'm struggling to participate. Now again, I'm trying to be honest with, with you all in terms of the challenge it is to participate when you got little kids, depending on their age. And that takes practice, and that's a whole other parenting night about how to train my child to sit still or to participate. If, they're not, if they, you can't get them to sit down and read a book, it's going to be hard for them to pay attention in the worship aid as well. If they've never sat for 30 seconds of silence um, or two minutes or just sit still at home in some way, how can they possibly sit still at math? So I've got to practice some of that ritual. Practice sitting. Okay, when we go into this room, we're going to sit still. Now, I sh you know, well, who's, how is he teaching us parenting? But I'm just saying it's going to be hard for a child to say, oh, sit still. And you're like, wait a minute, no, seven days a week at home when you never tell me to sit still, why do I have to sit still here? Oh, God's a bad guy, or the priest. You know, Father's going to be mad if you don't sit still, so then I become the bad guy. So we've got to practice giving praise to God, prayer. We've got to practice sitting still. We've got to practice listening, or this is going to be extra hard. So um, uh, that's, I don't want to get <laughs> sidetracked on uh, uh, parenting, but I think it's just, it's, it's a challenge. I just remember how my parents tried to do that as well. Um, let's just go on now. I'm going to do the liturgy of the word. That whole next section really is, um, I'm not going to go through every one of those lines. The liturgy, um, what are we giving um, here? What, what, what's, um, um, what am I coming, giving to God with my hands when I come here? I'm, I should be giving to God a listening ear and a listening heart. Because he, God's going to speak to us in that scripture. Now, I might not quite understand what it says because it's a complicated reading or something from the Old Testament that's about a war or some historical king, and I'm, like, I'm not getting much out of that. But I'm going to listen. I'm like, oh, I never heard of King Cyrus before. I wonder what he did. Oh, a pagan king built the temple for God. So I might look at King Cyrus. I'm like, I don't know anything about him. And if it's not being preached, I could go home and historically Google, who is King Cyrus? So I, I can engage, and I'm like, God just talked about King Cyrus, and God's thanking this pagan king. Didn't even believe in God. Said, you know what, I'm going to help these um, poor Israelites. I'm going to build them a temple for them. So King Cyrus kind of goes down as a saint. Anyway, it's an example of a historical figure that I can turn into something educational with my children. When we get home, don't forget to Google King Cyrus. We're going to find out who this guy is. Okay. So, and you can take little pens in your worship aid, which is, which is why I think it's helpful to have the worship aids now. We started those before, but in, during COVID, we have to have them. Um, bring a pencil and pen. Circle words in that, in that first reading that you don't know anything about or historical figure and say, ah, oh, I'm going to look that up when I get home in case the preacher doesn't preach about it. Or that passage from Paul, I don't understand that all. I need to go back and reread that at home. Um, 
So use it to mark up or ask your children to kind of do things, say, pick, pick three words in those readings um, that you don't understand what they mean. Pick two that um, make you smile. Pick um, one that makes you scratch your head. So you can do like these little exercises with them to help them pay attention to the word. And of course, it helps us adults as well. Um, so now you can actually use that worship aid a little more because now it's your take home sort of workbook. Okay, so I'm just giving you examples of how when we sit down for that liturgy of the word, which is a time sometimes all those scriptures go right over our head because you might be sitting down for the first time in a day or a week <laughs> to do nothing. So now you might be using the readings time um, for rest. And if that's what you need, then that's fine. But we should try to come to the Mass rested, because why? I'm here to give God an hour of my time for praise. Um, so if I only come here to rest because I've had a hard week, um, then that's, you can use it for that. Now I'm just getting. God, give me an hour where I can just sit down and I don't have to do anything. And if you need to use your hour for that week for that because it's been so bad, um, but it might, then I gotta slowly say, but I need to restructure my week so that when I get there on Sunday, I'm giving God the best of my time and not what's left over. And that's stewardship. So it's kind of like a tithing, is am I giving God the best hour of my week in my energy, my attention, my listening, my presence, my giving, or am I giving him what's left over? which I've preached on that before. Don't forget, Sunday is the first day of the week, so it's really Monday morning for God. And if you think about the energy we give to our work on Monday morning, the first hour of work, try to apply that to God. Say, give me your first hour of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. That's why we started off with Mass. Give to God your best hour on Sunday morning. Then this will make sense um, to us. If it's left over time, it's going to be hard to participate in that. So it's just a little plug about thinking about the rest of our week's schedule in order for the liturgy um, to uh, make sense. So the readings are all about giving God my attention, my ears, um, my heart, whatever he's going to speak to me. And, you know, so hopefully the homily I'm preaching speaks something to you, um, some message to you as well. But if it doesn't, you might say, you know, I, like this uh, past weekend I preached on Job and suffering. But you wanted to learn more about that healing he did of Simon, Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Never heard of Simon Peter's mother-in-law before. Um, so you can go back and do a little uh, look for a homily on Simon Peter's mother-in-law or something like that. So, because sometimes the preacher, uh, the, the priest might not preach on something you would like to have um, preached on, and you kind of do a little extra homework there as well. But again, I'm just kind of following through this giving, um, and what is God... Um, uh, what are we getting out of it, too? So we give God our listening ear. In the scriptures, what are we getting out of it? Hopefully some word of life. There was something in there that's going to make sense in my life. And so part of the preacher's job is to pull something there that I think is going to speak to your lives, my life, and our world. So this past weekend I preached on suffering because there's a lot of suffering in our world and in our personal lives. So I preached on that because I think it's most applicable um, for there. So what is God giving me? Oh, finally he's giving us a message on how to deal with suffering. Um, God is, not the priest. So God chose a reading about suffering because he knows we need to hear it as well. Um, so the priest is, part of his job, he does his homework, is to know what's happening in your lives and in the world and say, I think we most need to hear about this. Um, so then I kind of do that. So you know me, I kind of do some historical things, some Catholic theology things, but then the priest's job is to kind of um, take the scriptures and we say, break open the word to make sense of this in my life. Um, so God is giving us some message of hope or some sort of comfort to say, I'm here for you, I'm here to help you. That's what, that's what we're getting um, out of it. If we move down to, uh, I'll just use, use the profession of faith. Um, as an example. Oh, so wait a minute. Let me go back to now our peak, that, that flow line over there to the right, the column there. Um, so if you notice that it starts peaking, the first peak is right around the gospel time. And so, and you've heard me preach on this, so what happens? Big, loud, or, you know, and a big, bold, alleluia, because this is it. The gospel book, and I preached on this a couple weeks ago, 
that's the actual words of Jesus. So the rest of the Bible is all the word of God as well. But in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are actually the words of Jesus. So we carry that book in the procession. We reverently place it on the altar, which is also a symbol of Jesus. So this is a symbol of Jesus' word. The altar is a symbol of his sacrifice. The two of those are put together, and now we process with this. Oh my gosh, these are actually the words of Jesus in this book. The whole Bible is important, but that book that we process is Jesus' word. So we process it over there, and then the priest or the deacon opens it up because get ready, you're going to actually hear Jesus speak to you. Do you see why it's kind of a peak there? So it's different from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is important, but you're building up to what Jesus himself said. So it peaks at that time, and then the homily is an interpretation of, of the gospel and the scriptures there. And so then if, after that, we have the procession of faith and the, uh, the uh, universal prayer, general intercessions, and the presentation of the gifts. So you see kind of after the homily, there's kind of a, it starts going down, and what do we do? We sit down. So we stand for the gospel because this is a highlight time. Uh, we're building up to that. All that's kind of building up to the gospel. And then after the homily, we sit down and say, okay, let's take a break because in a sense, the preacher and you should be kind of jolted and almost exhausted from what we heard. If I really open my ears, I'm like, oh my gosh, God just you know, told me what, how our marriage is supposed to be or how I'm supposed to treat other people, I'm supposed to forgive my enemy. That's exhausting to think about how I'm supposed to apply that in my life. So I need to sit down. <laughs> so it's built into the liturgy to kind of plop down after that. We should be like, wow, I got a lot to work on. Interesting enough, when we were redoing uh, the Mass, the, the Roman Missal, the big red book that the priest uh, prays from, when that was being redone, um, has it been uh, eight, ten years ago, the whole thing was rewritten. So those prayers in that big, thick, red Roman Missal that the servers bring up to me and I pray from here, most of those prayers were written sometime between the second and the fifth century. So we respect that and those are handed down, so that's why I can't make up those prayers. But they're treasures to me because I know, like when I'm reading this, oh my gosh, St. Athanasia wrote that in the year 370, that prayer. And we're still using it today. So I get kind of excited about those prayers in there. Uh, but my, my point is that um, in that, um, in that uh, missal, those prayers are, are uh, giving praise to God in the Eucharistic prayer. But what I'm saying is that when, after the um, homily, when we sit down and we see the preparation of the altar, uh, it's kind of a low time of getting ready for the next peak moment here. So we have the presentation. Now we're going to start. Look, look when the, the curve changes during the preparation of the gifts and the presentation. You've heard me preach this time and again, that the bread and wine, when brought up, which is why symbolically it's so powerful when they're brought up from the back of the church, you know, eventually we'll be able to do that again and have people more involved in the liturgy for COVID that can't be involved. So the server still brings them up from the side tables, kind of representing the community. You've heard me preach this many times, because now, get ready, we're gonna start moving up towards a peak again. Why do we change at that moment? While it's a low time and you're sitting down, um, the priest is having this, in a sense, a private conversation with God during that presentation of the gifts um, there on behalf of the community. So it's not really private, but he's speaking to God, so you'll see me doing these prayers. But here's key. The bread and wine, I've said this a hundred times, the bread and wine represent your lives and what you're going through. So when that's brought to the altar, Your life and everything that's going on in your life, bring it to the altar. It's symbolically in that bread and in the wine. And think about this, again, talking to your children. Because that host has a million granules of wheat in it, or let's say a thousand, a thousand granules of little wheat crumbs, and then the water kind of makes it, so it's just water and wheat. Every one of those crushed grains of wheat is one of the thousand things going on in your life. It's so beautiful. Think about that host. Oh my gosh, there's my worry about my teenager. There's my marriage challenges. 
there's the, oh, that grain of wheat, that represents the sacrifice I made when my child was sick and I need to be extra patient. Oh, that grain of wheat represents my other child who's got a, you know, a learning disability and I have to spend extra time, so I put extra hours into helping that child with my homework. Oh, that, those big grains of wheat in the middle, that's the extra sacrifice it takes to be patient with my spouse or to spend quality time with my spouse. Um, that's all those grain noodles in the middle. And so you think about everything that's going on in your life are represented in each one of those grains. So your life, your worries, your sacrifices, all that you are doing for Jesus, and I always bring up the sacrifices you're doing as a parent and a spouse for those who are married, those are your Christian sacrifices. You're making sacrifices by teaching your children both schoolwork and their Christian Catholic faith. Every one of those extra five minutes, half hour, hours that you're putting in and you feel like, I can't know if I can give anymore, that's what you're bringing to the altar. Jesus, I'm exhausted. I'm beat. I've had a long week. I've been doing a lot. And I forgot that it's all for you, Jesus. So guess what, Jesus? All that I've been going on in my life, I'm going to bring to you here because I need you to bless it so that it becomes holy. Because I've been maybe doing it. I don't have the perfect intentions for it, but I'm going to bring it anyway. So your life, all of each of our lives, are brought there in this, in this big ciborium full of all these hosts representing all of us. The big host represents all of us as the body of Christ. Um, so we bring that to the altar. So what am, I, what am I giving at that moment? That It seems like a downtime, but it's building up. I'm giving, I'm giving it all to Jesus. So a lot of times during that time, there'll be the, a choir singing a song or a cantor it should be a downtime for you all. Um, there can be a hymn at the presentation, but in a sense, you shouldn't be singing at the time because you should be thinking about all your little grains of wheat that are being brought up there right now. If you haven't thought about your life and your, uh, your things you're doing for your children and your family as sacrifices, that's the time to do it. So try to close your eyes maybe at that time. It could be a beautiful song going on, or maybe it's just instrumental. Say, okay, Jesus, this is my life. In that, it's in that host, it's in that bread. Take it, take it. I'm giving you um, my words and my joys. So I don't mean like it's all a burden, but you're also bringing our joys. Oh my gosh, God, here's all my blessings. And that's the other part I want to uh, get to. Um, so half of the hosts are your sacrifices, and the other half is your list of gratitude, um, which is part of all of this, giving praise to God for gratitude. Um, and I want to kind of wrap up with that later on in a little bit about how to come to Mass with hearts of gratitude for the blessings in our life. Because usually our, our, we have a very long list of everything that's not going right or I wish was different. Um, and the goal is that that list gets shorter and my list of gratitude gets longer. That's the spiritual journey. My list of gratitude gets longer and my list of complaints or wish that things were different gets shorter. That doesn't mean it's all going to go away. I'm going to focus less on what I don't have and focus more on what I do have. So, the other part of the host is saying, I've got to count my blessings. This is a great exercise with children, um, just in case I don't get to it after a while. We have to develop a sense of gratitude in our personal lives and in the lives of our children. How does that happen? And I think you're trying to do this with your children, teaching them um, not just say, oh, don't forget to say thank you, you know, but how to count blessings every day. So you can do this, um, maybe it's at the supper table. In addition to, bless us, O Lord, these thy gifts, Everybody goes around, say one thing they're grateful for before your night prayer together as well. The other thing I like to do, and this is great for children, is to dart a little um, uh, journal, a little booklet of gratitude. Let it keep them by their bedside. Maybe some of you do a version of this already. Um, so write two things down, maybe three, maybe five. Every night before you go to bed, one, two, three, five things for which you're grateful. Write them down, and guess what? On Sunday, let's bring our little booklet journal of gratitude to church with us. And I'm going to bring that. So when I'm singing that song, we thank you, God, for all you've given us, I'm actually holding that little journal booklet. Or my child is, or I am. Or if you don't want to bring it to church, you're going to get it lost. You can leave it at home, but say, on your way here in the car, say, now let's think about everything that's in our gratitude list. What were we grateful for that we've been saying at our supper table before we go to bed? What did you write in your journal of gratitude as well? Those are the things we want to think about, we want to thank God for when we come there. You with me so far? I'm kind of rushing through things here. 
But when that bread and wine can be altar, um, maybe you can think the bread can be your sacrifices and the wine can be your prayers of thanksgiving or mix them together in that host with the wheat there. Um, but it's sacrifices and gratitude. So I'm doing all of that, and then the priest is raising those up. That was a whole other talk I did on just walking through the Eucharistic course. I'm not going to do that um, tonight. Um, I did that um, last year for our First Communion and for the whole parish as well. I think some of you were, were there for that and for extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion too. So there's a whole other night just on the Eucharistic prayer because that's got a lot going on in it as well in terms of thanking God and asking God um, for all these things. So now we're in the liturgy of the Eucharist. Um, we brought our gifts, our lives to the altar, and now you'll see it uh, moving up to another crescendo. Where does it take? With the great Amen. Notice how the music changes at the Amen. Like the Alleluia, we're going to have something triumphal on feast days. There's going to be you know, trumpets and the servers bring the bells. Um, all this because the Amen is saying all that the Eucharistic prayer prayed for, which is a whole other night, um, thanking God, help us, praying for the Pope, praying for the dead, um, you know, the consecration of the bread and the wine into the body and blood, and I don't mean to make light of that. That's a, that's a peak moment leading up to the great peak. The Amen is saying, wow, this is now no longer bread but the body of Christ, no longer wine but the blood of Christ, and I believe in the resurrection, and I believe that Jesus suffered and died for me. Listen to the words of that Eucharistic prayer. It's saying all of this. It's a lot that's being prayed for in that Eucharistic prayer. And the Amen says, yes, Lord, do all that for us. Do all of that. Amen is, yes, I believe this. I believe this is the body and blood. I believe that you raise up the dead um, to heaven. I believe that you're going to take care of us. You forgive our sins. Amen is, I believe. And we shout that out. Um, loudly and um, with great joy because we're, it's the culmination uh, of everything that we've been praying for in the Mass. Uh, again, I can say a lot more about that. Um, and, but when I, when I show that line going down as a day crescendo, it doesn't mean that it's not important um, because you can look at communion as kind of on the downslide. Going to communion is certainly a highlight. Um, but I'm going to communion because I said Amen, I believe um, that now I've, I've proclaimed Jesus. I believe this really is your body and blood. Now I actually get to go receive you. Um, but first I have to proclaim that I really uh, do believe that. And then we kind of, the Lord's Prayer, and then we actually receive the Holy Communion. Um, some prayer of silence um, and praise is so important um, there as well. So the, the communion hymn, again, like the, the other songs, is a prayer. So we, the communion hymn is normally a refrain, so we try to repeat refrains so we can memorize them, so you can be singing as you're going to communion. So it's usually a refrain, uh, and then the cantor choir sings verses in between, so that you can be, and it's about communion and the Eucharist there as well. But it's a prayer, and then, so I should be praying that prayer during communion, and then when I come back, then the priest, um, we sit down for a moment, then I can do a little bit of a, it's kind of a private prayer time, but it's also, while I'm sitting here praying for my needs, I'm praying for, you know, some sick relatives and some sick parishioners, but while I'm praying for all those people and I'm praying for my own conversion, I, need, I got these sins I'm working on, while I'm praying those, in a sense, privately, my prayers are being united with everybody else. So let's say you're praying, dear Lord, help our marriage, you know, we're struggling with this, help me to forgive my spouse. While you're praying for that, a hundred other spouses are praying that prayer too. So you're, you're uniting your private prayer for your marriage, for your children, for teenagers, for the poor. Any private prayer you're going, it's connected with everybody else. So communion prayer is really a unifying thing as well as the communion I itself is. Okay, um, I, I don't want to go into the rest of those, but I just kind of want to highlight um, that. I want to take a breath and a break. Um, give me some feedback. Is this making sense or helpful or new? Um, what, which thing that was said so far was either really new for you or just a, a good refresher that you needed to hear? Anybody willing to share? It was a lot.
Okay, great. So she was saying that, um, uh, yeah, that's been very helpful. And yeah, we, you know, we didn't get this growing up, because how do you explain this to a second grader, right? Or third grader. Um, but I think, and again, so I appreciate your saying that. But my goal is that, A, I want to get feedback and send it to Jane as well in an email that, um, yeah, use that n next year for the class too, or do something different, or you like the whole thing just on the Eucharistic prayer. Because the goal is that the more you learn about this, then you're going to teach your children some version of this. Or like, oh, no, this is the exciting part, the gospel. Watch that book, you know. Or, um, or since we, now we know it's a highlight, um, if you've got, you got the Sunday readings ahead of time and we send those out to everybody on Thursday night, the scripture readings, let's look at that gospel together as a family on Saturday morning or maybe Thursday night because we send that out on Thursday afternoon. Stephen sends it out. If you don't get the... I hope you get the, the email. If you don't, let us know. But all the readings are sent out. That worship aid is sent out ahead of time. For those who are online, the worship aid is sent. Print out that worship aid um, before you watch Mass online or, or come to Mass um, if you're able to. And it's just like all, we send them out on Thursdays to prepare you for what's going to happen on the weekend because it's a lot going on. So anyway, hopefully this, then you slowly pass it on to your children and uh, at their age-appropriate level. Um, but I think the main thing is for you to, because you're, you're creative as parents, how can you now implement this into your second, third, or fourth grade child's um, actions? Either, like I said, by what's happening at Mass, keeping a gratitude journal at home, being grateful. Um, maybe you want to talk about what are the sacrifices um, that each person makes, and what a great way to acknowledge. Uh, let's say, you know, child A did something for the family. They were super helpful and they cleaned the garage. Um, we want to thank, you know, Drew because he was, I made all these sacrifices to clean the garage. That was a big sacrifice, Drew. You did that. You gave up some time to do that. You're acknowledging each other's sacrifices as well. Um, let's bring that to mass, um, that little sacrifice. Again, it doesn't seem like, oh, I, I didn't do that for God, but they're just slowly learning that sacrifices for family and community can actually be brought to God. Did I make, and now you as parents are making tons of sacrifices, um, but how do we train our children like, let's, no, let's do that. Um, let's, uh, let's help um, the soup cans that we collected for Super Bowl Sunday. Let's volunteer to help take those to the food pantry. Yep, that's, that is, is a sacrifice. It's a Saturday night or Sunday afternoon. Let's make that sacrifice together for Jesus or, you know, other ways that we're always inviting you, especially in a post-COVID world, to get involved in making sacrifices for your parish, for God, and for um, why, why you're doing that. So thank you for that little feedback. Yeah, and again, each of these I could say a lot more, but I wanted to at least give an overview um, of that, that I hopefully you can um, reflect on more um, as you're thinking about the giving and the getting, the sacrifices and the thanksgiving. Those are kind of my main themes that I wanted to, I'm, I'm, what am I getting out of this, but also what am I giving? If I'm not giving my heart to God in that opening hymn, that's a growth area for me. And you might want to think about, which of these do you feel like you're doing well in? And which of these is a growth area for you? Um, you know, like, um, I'm, this is the time of Mass when I'm most distracted uh, during the reading. So my growth area is trying to be more focused. <clears throat> How am I going to do that? Well, if I've got too many little children, it's kind of hard to be focused. So I've got to think about something different. That means I got to make the sacrifice of being sure I go over those readings before I get to church because I not, might not be able to listen to them if I'm babysitting for, you know, a couple kids. Um, so I got to do extra sacrificial homework of looking over those readings so I'm not just hearing them for the first time and they go right over my head. What sacrifices am I going to make to make this a really deep, prayerful experience? Why am I saying all this? Basically, this is kind of where the rubber hits the road. I gave this, what really makes a difference? And I asked this in my homily, why do I come to church here? Is it to fulfill a Sunday obligation? Is it because all my friends do and, you know, it's expected? Is it because um, I hope my kids are going to be Catholic? Is it, why am I really doing all of this? I mean, why are you here tonight? It's where the rubber hits the road where I finally say, this matters. This matters in my personal life, my relationship with God, my family life, and our ultimate goal of heaven. And 
So that tonight isn't just like, oh, I went to that parent night and checked that out the box. And while part of that's true, I really hope that something, and when I do these, it, it changes me too when I see you making sacrifice and being here. It helps me pray better as a priest. I want to say that. Um, like you need good holy priests and good preachers. A priest needs good holy lay people and marriages and our other single parents who are making sacrifices. Your life, you being here tonight, enriches my life. And it's going to make me pray better um, on Sunday. But I'm like, wow, those parents made this sacrifice. They, you inspire me. But what I'm also saying is that, in a sense, we're all here, the rubber hits the road. Um, whereas, you know, every morning I get up and do my holy hour, my prayer, and I could say, oh, you know, I live alone. Nobody's going to know if I do my prayer. No, it does. This is with rubber. If I don't make that sacrifice of doing my prayer time in the morning, none of this matters. <laughs> it's just a job. It's similar for you all. You're Catholic. You're, uh, you're Catholic parents. Um, it matters that you're here tonight. It matters that you're trying to implement the significance of the Mass and the Eucharist in your life and your children's life. It really matters. So thank you. Um, and you're making a difference in your child's life. So uh, thank you for that. I want to do um, a couple things now, um, and maybe for the next 10 minutes before we wrap up. And that is... Um, Two things. I'm going to get to the second handout. On the back side of your paper, hopefully you printed that out, the second side. And I'm talking about the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. So now I, I walk through the, again, you're like, I thought this was a, a talk on the Eucharist. Um, but it is. But I first needed to walk through the liturgy, which is the Eucharist. Um, and then, um, by the way, the word Eucharist is, uh, is thanksgiving. That's where that word comes from. Um, Eucharistia means to give thanks. And uh, first century Christians started using that um, prayer, Eucharistia. It's a Greek word. And that's where we get, um, get it because they're like, what are we going to call this thing we do every Sunday for an hour? Why did they pick Sunday, by the way? There's Catholic trivia stuff. Why did they pick Sunday? Because that was the day that Jesus rose from the dead, right? So he dies on a Friday. Third day later, Sunday, he rises from the dead. So remember all the Jews, which was Jesus and all the apostles, they were Jews. Your holy day is Saturday. That's the Sabbath, is Saturday. So Jews, from Friday sunset until Saturday sunset, go into Sabbath rest. This was radical when the Christians moved the Sabbath to Sunday because it was the day the Lord rose from the dead. Um, but this was a radical, when they were shifting from, oh, let's see, I was raised Jewish, but I followed Jesus, so they, those, that first century, they really struggled with keeping their Jewish traditions and yet believing Jesus. He is the Messiah that the Jews were waiting for. But one of the, when they were making that shift to move the Sabbath to Sunday was a big thing. Um, so a lot of like, things shifted when they're like, okay, we are actually not Jewish anymore. Um, we now worship on Sunday. Or I'm now... Um, you know, eating pork, or I now believe there's a Messiah. I'm not waiting for the Messiah. So this whole thing of switching from Jews. And so one of the things is um, the Sunday is the Lord Day. So the, and they started calling it um, the Eucharist, Eucharist because what do we call this hour that we give thanks? Ah, let's just use the word Thanksgiving. Eucharist, Eucharistia. So that's how we get that word um, for us um, uh, in the scriptures. So I want to talk now, shift on the back side, to the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. I want to spend about just five or ten minutes on this, and we'll wrap up with prayer. Because, um, in case you haven't read any surveys in the last um, five years, uh, that about, um, I think the percentage is, 60% of Catholics said they don't necessarily believe that the bread changes into the body of Christ. That they, they it's a symbol, I don't, I don't know if the miracle, you know, I... I mean, my parents believe that, but I'm not sure I really believe it's the real presence of Jesus that the, that the bread changes into the body of Christ. Like 60% of Catholics. So we priests and bishops had a wake-up call like, whoa, we haven't been talking about that. We just assume people knew that or believe that or their parents taught them that. So we have to go back and we've got to now <laughs> teach something that used to be obvious. 
and what this means, this miracle, that this bread, the sacrifice of your life and your thanksgiving, now, through the imposition of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, send down your power upon these gifts, so Holy Spirit, that they may become the body and blood of Christ. So there's two parts when this miracle happens. The Holy Spirit coming down to bless it, and then the actual words of Jesus, this is my body given up for you, and this is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. So in a sense, there's two parts of this consecration. Now the Easter, if you want a little trivia here, the Eastern half of the world, Christians, um, they believe that it becomes the body and blood of Christ when you call down the Holy Spirit. The Western half of Christians believe that that's the prelude to it, but the consecration actually happens with when I say this is my body and this is my blood. Um, so you got kind of like, because we're one big global community, it just kind of developed. It's not right or wrong, but anyway, we follow the Western tradition that the Holy Spirit first comes down and blesses it, um, and then um, together. But in reality, what we believe is that the whole Eucharistic prayer, the liturgy of the Eucharist there, all of that is consecrating it into the body of, and blood of Christ. But we highlight particularly this moment, this is my body, this is my blood, where it actually changes into the body and blood of Jesus. Um, but we've got two parts there. So we need to spend a little time talking about this real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, because I don't know where you're at with this. If 60% of Catholics don't believe it, 60% of our parish might not believe it. I don't know. Um, so what are, I put down here, external signs of this is really Jesus and internal signs. How do we show and teach our children that we believe that this isn't a piece of bread? It is the body of Christ. Or we say the bread of life, because Jesus himself uses that phrase the scriptures do, but we say the body of Christ. So what are the, ex everybody got that back seat side there? The external signs is genuflection. And this is where um, I need you to practice yourself and with your children how to do a genuflection. So it's one of the first signs we do of showing that in a Catholic church something is different. And where do we reserve the Blessed Sacrament in the Catholic church? But in the tabernacle. And I'm going to make these, um, James uh, wants me to make these little videos um, for uh, children um, as well. But for us, uh, the Blessed Sacrament, meaning the Eucharist, the body of Christ, is kept in the tabernacle. One, for prayer. Two, to take communion to the, holy, to the sick. So um, we have the Eucharist back there. So as soon as we come into church, we genuflect. And in case you've gotten, we all get a little lax in our genuflections, and be sure you practice this every Sunday between now and their first communion, that this now becomes a habit. A genuflection, I know this seems obvious, but it's not to the majority of Catholics. So a genuflection for those who are able to, unless you have a disability with knees or so forth, um, but a genuflection is your right knee, show this to the children, your right knee goes all the way to the floor and while you're down here to make it reverent, I would say make the sign of the cross and then get back up. Okay. But what do 99% what do of Catholics do? And then they kind of go into their pew. So let's all, as a sign of reverence, um, of this is really the body of Christ in that tabernacle. Um, first, when we come into church, whether you do it right when you come into church, like right inside the doors, or when you come into your pew, let's all, for the next... Um, nine weeks before their first communion, if you would practice with them one-on-one -on -one of a full, reverent genuflection, knee touches the floor, while you're down there, make the sign of the cross, that helps from doing just this sort of a thing. Um, I always say it looks kind of like, the, Catholics look like the scarecrow that doesn't have any legs <laughs> in the Wizard of Oz. Um, so let's, I really want to encourage you to practice that. What knee goes to the floor? Right knee. Um, for those of you who got that, it's, it's all obvious, but most Catholics don't know how to do a genuflection. And why are we genuflecting? We don't genuflect to the gospel book. We don't genuflect to the altar. We don't genuflect to the cross. What are we genuflecting to? The real presence of Jesus in the tabernacle, which in our church is dead center right behind the altar. Okay, just a quick brush up on, tab on a tabernacle and a genuflection. So please practice that. Um, and you can't expect, you know, you might need to come to church an extra five or ten minutes early or on a weekday and practice with your child a genuflection. A, when you come to church here, then strongly, this is part of your homework, 
is that sometime, preferably weekly, minimally monthly, you as you and your child go to the Blessed Sacrament Chapel. There's a whole room back there if you haven't been there. It's a prayer room for you and for your children. Back there. That prayer room is designed for you. And that tabernacle is the presence of God. It's the most calming space in St. Clair County. Quiet, calming, peaceful, the presence of Jesus. So, genuflection and find some time before Mass, after Mass. Go down and kneel in there. And this is a time with your children. Maybe this is when they bring their journal of gratitude. Let's go back there and and let's maybe read some of the things you want to thank Jesus for, because he's in this tabernacle, okay? So, um, and that's a whole other sort of field trip that I usually do with the kids. We can't now in COVID, but actually to open the door and show them where the door is and so forth. And the red candlelight um, called the sanctuary lamp represents the presence of Jesus. So that's another um, unique Catholic thing, the, the red candle. So if your child doesn't know that, um, you're the ones that have to teach them. Take them back there. And then um, I did a whole video on the tabernacle, on the sanctuary lamp, by the way, on YouTube, if you want to look that up on our YouTube channel. And I did a, I don't know if you saw those, I did uh, 11 videos on our whole church, you know, the crucifix and the tabernacle and the stations of the cross. So if you haven't seen those, you can go back and look at those on our YouTube channel. But one of them is specifically on the tabernacle and the candle above with the angels. So that, your children might find that interesting if you haven't watched that together. Genuflection. The other thing, an external sign of reverence to Jesus in the Eucharist is the bow before we actually receive on the body of Christ. So we'll practice that with your children. Um, it's, a, it's a bowing of the head. When we bow to the altar, um, just distinguish a little bit, it's a full bow at the waist. And so we bow, to, um, we bow to the scriptures, and we bow to the altar, and we bow um, well, to one another. But that's a full bow uh, at the waist. When you're receiving communion, um, the bishops have created asking us to bow our heads um, like this before we receive communion. So that's part of the practice that you'll do with them as well. Other external signs, the real presence of Jesus, my words. So receiving Jesus in the Eucharist on Sunday should change the way I talk. (laughs) That's an external sign. If my words of what I'm saying, um, not that we're perfect, but my words this week should be more gent- gentler and more loving and kinder and reverent every time I receive the Eucharist. Because he's physically, I always say this, if I'm struggling with kind words and patient words, I say, when you go to Holy Communion, that's Jesus himself touching your tongue and your lips to say, I want to change that. Because you become kind of mute or your tongue is twisted with not so loving words. So if if you're struggling with words, then when you go to communion, let the host just sit on your tongue for an extra two seconds and say, Jesus, heal my mouth to say more loving words. It's an external sign that this is the real presence of Jesus in my mouth, now in my gut, and in my heart because it gets into our whole body. Other external signs, my action, listening, compassion, and generosity. Then some internal signs. I should notice the difference, and these are conversations with your children as well. Internal signs. My thoughts um, should be more forgiving and more loving. My heart should let go of grudges and angers. Um, By receiving Jesus, once it goes into my mouth and into my stomach, what happens when things get into our stomach? They literally get into our bloodstream and our bone marrow. Literally. So now, my... uh, uh, my heart should start letting go of things if it's been hardened, um, are my thoughts as well. And then my own inner holiness and a reverence for the inner holiness of others. So if I've been super judgmental um, by categories of people, the Eucharist should slowly, as it gets more and more into my bone marrow and into my bloodstream Sunday after Sunday, I will physically change. Which is why it pains me when someone just stops going to Mass, or they just start going to, you know, oh, we just like the, the non-denominational church down the street because they got a, you know, this, this rock band or something like that. I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, how could you let your, I would say, your bone marrow and your bloodstream 
get clogged by not having Jesus come into it every week. I can't comprehend that, but it's because I'm Catholics in, in my body as well. Um, but I think the more we talk about this with our children um, and they see it, um, which is your homework assignment, by the way, I'm going to lead right into that now. The other sheet handout that we have are some three questions. This is a homework assignment heavy because normally what pre-post-COVID, we have more table conversations where I have more activities, so sorry we can't do that as much tonight. So I'm, this is going to be a homework assignment. And the three questions on here are, what are the challenges of keeping Sunday Mass the top priority of your week? Meaning not what's left over, but the top priority. So, and so, many of you are so good at this already. You, you schedule your family around the Mass. That means they've got to sacrifice uh, this sporting event or sacrifice that traveling or I rearrange it so that I keep Sunday. So thanks to those of you who do that, um, but that's part of the sacrifice we have to make. And you have to talk about this with the children when they say, ah, oh, wah, wah, wah. You know, I want to have this sleepover. Again, I'm using pre-COVID examples here. Um, if it's not the top priority, what needs to change? What has to happen in our, again, some, some people can only pray Mass online for COVID reasons. But either way, um, if you're only praying Mass online, um, then how do I train my child to sit for that hour? Big sacrifice. <laughs> to sit for an hour at home to pray this Mass um, and to be involved. But maybe, for those who are praying at home, maybe this diagram will help um, do that. The second question is, what are the ways that you notice the Eucharist helping you and your family? Internal signs. Again, I've used examples like this in my homily um, oftentimes. Is that, um, I'll just use an example. You're in the car driving home, and I know that I have um, uh, not been the most caring, loving, encouraging person in our family this past week. So I'm in the car, and I say to my second grader, fourth grader, teenager, um, you know what? Gosh, you know, mass really Im impacted me, and I'm realizing I haven't been very kind to all of you this past week. And the teenager says, we know that, you know. And he said, but you know what? I really felt Jesus come into my heart, and so this week I'm going to work really hard at how I speak to all of you. Um, now, I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm really going to try hard because I just noticed Jesus coming into my heart, and I'm really going to work at saying kinder, gentler words, or not, or talking less. I'm just going to be more quiet. Um, and then, um, maybe by Friday, give me some feedback <laughs> if Jesus made any difference in my words. Um, but I'm admitting to my children that I need help. And then, Another example would be, um, you know, Wednesday dinner table. What are we grateful for? You know what I'm grateful for? Um, I'm going to keep using Drew as an example. You know, Drew's had a bad attitude the last couple weeks, but I noticed since Sunday, and he received the Eucharist, I noticed him complimenting somebody, and he was a little more helpful. So, Drew, I think the Eucharist is having an impact on your life. Teenagers going to be like, what? You noticed that? And you're giving credit to God and the Eucharist for something somebody did nice. So it's your job, what a great opportunity for you to bring up examples. Every time you see some, the smallest little act of kindness, think, ah, Jesus and the Eucharist help us. You know? Or prepare them for when they're saying, I have a hard time being nice to my sister. You know? Well, this is what First Communion is going to help us do. You know? Or we can start asking Jesus for that um, now. So, um, Anyway, how's it making a difference in my life? Um, and then the third question I have on there is, um, what do you most want your children to know and experience in receiving the body and blood of Christ? Um, beyond being reverent, um, what are big values and virtues? What are the virtues you want your child to have? Um, you know, look up some, some good Christian virtues and values um, and to be, start to be praying about those um, already. Homework. So I've given you lots of homework. I've, given you, I've tried to give you examples of how to, um, some child-friendly um, activities you can do um, that relate um, to this for yourself and then for your children. And then um, homework for you personally, um, single parents, or share it with a friend, and then or as couples. Um, and this can't be done just all tonight. This would maybe if you're married, each person writes out um, these, and then you actually plan a conversation as a couple 
or a single person with a friend or parent. Um, and then it can be age appropriate, turn it into a family conversation um, as well. Saying, so, you know what, we, um, we want to talk about the challenges of, of, of mass. Um, and what, what can we do to make this a, a better experience um, for all of us? Okay. I covered a lot. Um, uh, and I don't know if it's even fair to ask, are there questions or comments about what you heard? Or would you like a little more, another example? Or I try to make them practical with some little ideas or tools for you to, to do. Because you've got so much going on in your life already, but any, any little things you can do where I say the rubber hits the road, hopefully um, some things that you're walking away with. Um, but also lots of homework. Um, uh, speaking of homework, Remember I said track A, track B, track C? Um, those who want to are all in. We invested and bought for you these little magazines. So these aren't free. <laughs> Actually, there's a little gift from you, um, for you from your parish. <clears throat> and Jane and I were talking about like how to make this, this, hand, this, this handout's going to be on your way out tonight. You haven't been given it yet. Jane and I were saying, you know, so this doesn't get lost in a pile. What can we do? So those who um, are willing to do track B and C, I mean, we're going to do a little bit more than economy basic, um, or we're going to go all the way to first class, business class, um, that we thought about that each um, page could be a Sunday activity. So, um, I mean, the first is just like an introductory page from the authors about um, you are your child's best teacher. Um, but then explaining the real presence of Jesus to your children. So it's, it's, it's easy reading, but instead of just saying, oh, we've got to get through this whole thing, it's a lot, say, so you know what? You pick which Sunday, so if it's this Sunday or next, but four Sundays in a row, you as parent are going to read this and then plan a family activity. And you pick out when, when is a good time for you. So you're going to say to your, I'm going to use a second grader, to my second grader, now, we're going to pick four Sunday afternoons, as an example, Four Sunday afternoons, and find out when's a good time for them, you know what I mean, like, um, when they're willing to sit down, and we're going to have 40 minutes of prayer time and conversation about First Communion, kind of our First Communion, and you can make it fun. We're going to have First Communion cookies and whatever, and, ch and chocolate milk or whatever, um, and it's going to be our First Communion time together. So find some way to make it special. And then you turn this, this page into a conversation, an activity. So we're giving you some leeway of how you want to do that. Or maybe yours is going to be Thursday night. Um, but to find, I think it's like to be consistent. Oh, this is Thursday night. This is family night um, for First Communion prep or something like that. And then find some way so it's not just another homework lesson, but probably how you could turn it into something fun that they would like. If it's popcorn that you want to do it over. Um, so then there's lesson one. The, the middle section, which is the, the centerfold section, it's, it's two pages, but it's one activity. It's one conversation. So it, it'll make sense to you that in terms of the title. Um, and then the third um, week is also a, an open double page thing. So that would be Sunday three or Thursday night three. Um, so anyway, so it's breaking into four little sections and uh, just trying to make it helpful for you and turn it into an activity rather than just something you just got to sit down and read through. No, this is a, a gift to you to help you in forming your child and their faith. So you're gonna, the other homework was practicing genuflection, um, weekly uh, visit to the Blessed Sacrament Chapel, hopefully for some prayer time as well, possibly doing a, a, a gratitude journal um, talking about sacrifices, complimenting and encouraging each other around the family table as well, um, and then talking about the real presence of Jesus and what it means um, to, to you personally. So that we come back to our hands. Um, we all got shriveled up hands and mouths and hearts, um, but Jesus wants to heal it so we can open them up and give our lives back to God more fully um, in glorifying God. Any other comments or questions? If not, um, I'd just like to lead us in a prayer now. We wrap up. 
just invite you for your prayer. For those who are watching online, if you can, um, if it's possible to have some quiet time in your home for a minute. And I just want to sit down and guide us through a little prayer. So we are here in front of the Blessed Sacrament Chapel ourselves, in front of the crucifix. Um, so maybe if you just want to um, look at the tabernacle or look up at the crucifix yourself um, to help keep you focused, or uh, if you can just close your eyes and join me in a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So take a moment to, it's flowing from this presentation, think about a couple things that you personally want to thank Jesus for in your personal life. Obviously your family, but in your personal life, what difference does Jesus make to you and what do you want to thank him for? I'd like you to focus on, um, some of you have several children, but focus for a minute just on the child in your life that's preparing for their first communion in a couple months. So just take a moment now and picture them almost like their baby at their baptism and take a moment to like present your baby, your child to Jesus and picture you handing your child over to Jesus and talk to Jesus about what you want to thank him for, gifts and blessings in this particular child, his personality, his character. So what do you just want to thank Jesus for in this child? Jesus created your, this child in a very unique way. That's an understatement. <laughs> but what do you want to, how did the things that he formed your child to be. Just take a moment to express gratitude for the way God created and formed your child. And then also talk to Jesus about specific things you want to ask Jesus to help your child with. Um, his, his or her self-esteem, their confidence, their interior life. Basically, what, what do you want to ask Jesus to place in your child's mind and heart right now? I would just invite you, let us all look up at the crucifix for a moment and picture yourself um, and your family, however big your family is, but your children, you're, you're married, you're, you place your family at the, right at the feet of Jesus there, maybe in that little rectangle underneath his feet. So picture your family underneath there and just take a moment to consecrate your family to Jesus. And just consecrate him, dedicate your family, and ask his arms to just watch over and bless your family.
and we unite all these prayers of gratitude and asking for Jesus' help. We pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Through the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So on your way out, um, Jane has a few things um, to pick up. The, that booklet, I think there's another handout she said. And um, then we do, have, we do have little samples of the host. Um, only take one of those if it's really, really neat. I, I kind of want to, sort of want to discourage tasting the host at home because I just think it can confuse them, like we're eating something home and you got here. But if your child has some anxiety or fear about putting something new in their mouth, then be sure and take one. But anyway, that's only for uh, exceptional case if you need to do that. Um, but also it can be kind of a surprise for them as well. Um, and then handout. And then I always just, I'm always looking for any feedback necessarily, if there's anything that you um, would encourage to do again or do differently or highlight differently in, in future talks with um, parents. Um, I appreciate the feedback. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks for all you do. Thanks for those of you who are committed here every week, um, either in person or online. Um, thanks for your commitment. and. I'm just going to pray for you every day, I really do, that the Lord help you in, in your challenges and um, in the hard work and sacrifices it takes to be a parent. So thank you for your example and your witness to me. Have a great day. You can practice your first full reverent genuflection before you leave. <laughs>